Okay, um, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. I, it's amazing to see this turnout. <laughs> I was telling Dr. Garcia that she may be our fall 2020 brown bag superstar <laughs> for the, um, the <laughs> response that she has um, elicited. So congratulations on that. Um, so I want to welcome you all today. We have Dr. Garcia here. Um, just a quick note before I turn this over to Julianne, who's going to uh, uh, introduce Dr. Garcia. Um, for those of you who typically are regulars um, for the brown bag, this is gonna be a little bit of a different format. Um, rather than have Dr. Garcia present and then we have a Q&A at the end, um, we're really just opening this up and making this um, an informal type of dialogue. We have, we. Uh, Julianne and Jahan have worked on um, preparing some topics to discuss, but this is more of an open forum, I guess you could say. Um, and if anything comes up or if anything changes direction, Julianne and Jahan are going to kind of uh, moderate this discussion for us today. Um, so just a note, if you're used to the brown bag typical format, this is definitely gonna be a little bit different today. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Julianne um, for our introduction and then Jahan, the two of them will uh, keep you moving in the right direction for the next hour or so. So take it away, Ju Julianne. Great, thank you, Colleen. <laughs> Um, so I am so grateful to have Dr. Claudia Garcia here with us today, um, and I'm just going to read a small biography and then turn it over to her because I see that we have a lot of people and I'm sure people have so many questions for you. Um, so Dr. Garcia's extensive publication record on bilingualism and the education of bilinguals is grounded in her experience living in New York City after leaving Cuba at the age of 11. Among her best known books are Bilingual Education in the 21st Century, A Global Perspective and Translanguaging, uh, Language, Bilingualism and Education. She was the past general editor of the International Journal of the Sociology of Language and past co-editor of Language Policy. Dr. Garcia received an honorary doctorate from Bang Street Graduate School of Education in 2016, the Charles Ferguson Award from the Center of Applied Linguistics in 2017, the Lifetime Career Award from the American Educational Research Association in 2017, the Graduate Center Excellence in Mentoring Award in 2018, um, American Educational Research Association, AERA, has awarded her the Lifetime Achievement Award, Division G, Distinguished Contributions to Social Context in Education Research, the Second Language Acquisition SIG Leadership through Research Award, and the Bilingual Education SIG Lifetime Career Award in 2017. She is also currently a member of the National Academy of Education of the United States. Um, and she has a much more, um, even larger um, uh, list of accomplishments in her lifetime and so many people I know here have been inspired by her work and would not be doing the work that they're doing without her work. So thank you so much for being here, Dr. Garcia. Thank you, Julianne. Um, it's a real pleasure to be with you today. Um, I hardly recognize myself in the introduction that Julianne has uh, given all of you. It's interesting that uh, this isolation sort of uh, makes us go into ourselves and understand some things that we have not understood about us because we've been working so hard and so fast. So it's good to have the pause that this uh, crisis has afforded us. And it's good to be able to reflect on the work with young people because after all, I am now retired and it's now in your hands. Um, so I want to thank Julianne, but I also want to say um, thank Colleen McDermott, who has kept me uh, informed all this time of every step that we have taken, and Jahan also for her uh, organization skills. And of course, I love to have to be here with Anel and Wanda. Uh, thank you for being with us. And um, I have to remember also Mary Curran, uh, who cannot be here today, but um, um, 
She was the first one who initiated this invitation. And Rutgers is uh, close to my heart. I think um, my husband's first faculty position was in the language and education division of Rutgers. So um, I'm glad he left you because I met him at City College when he left you. Uh, so um, it's good to be with you again. Thank you. So I, well, I, I have a few topics to open it up, but uh, before I do that, I was wondering if there was anything that you wanted to, in, in particular, start with concerning the topic that we have, which is um, multilingual acquisition through a translanguaging lens. So I can tell you a little bit about myself and, um, and how I've gotten here, and I think the message that I would like young people to understand, because I think it's very important. Um, you know, I'm, I'm of a different generation when scholars were looking at things differently, when scholars were looking at language and bilingualism in a different, in a very different way. Um, and um, in a lot of ways, um, that's what I did for many, many years until I started trusting what I was observing. It's very, very difficult, I think, for young scholars to trust their own lenses. But if there's one important message that I want to give you is to trust what it is that you see and what you hear, not what others tell you to hear and to see. Uh, because when we talk about multilingual acquisition and translanguaging, what I think I most understand is how my lenses as a young scholar had been uh, in some ways blurred by the scholarship that I was reading uh, that did not in any way reflect what I was observing and listening to in my own community uh, in classrooms with teachers. Uh, and what they were telling me was happening with language uh, was just not what I was seeing. Um, so that's, that's, I think, the first lesson. The first lesson is to be able to, yes, um, stand on the shoulders of those who have come before you, of scholars who have looked before, but also to be able to interpret and see through your own lenses, the lenses of a new generation, I think a generation that has opened up new spaces for all of us. And um, I think that is, that is uh, most important. Um, so I think that, that first. Um, secondly, you know, how did I, how did I um, start to talk about translanguaging? I started to talk about translanguaging, first of all, again, because I had been in contact with other people. And uh, yes, I've always said uh, translanguaging was a term that was coined in Welsh um, by a Welsh educator, by Ken Williams, someone that I met a long, long time ago. And he said to me, um, Ophelia, what you're saying is wrong. Um, and I was a young scholar then. Uh, come and see what we're doing in, in Wales. And, um, you know, he took me into classrooms and there I saw it. There I saw that there was something going on that was different from what we were doing in the United States. Uh, and that is um, the languages were not in any way separated. This, the um, uh, books were not in an English classroom and a Welsh classroom, but they were together. And children were being allowed to make meaning of this together. And as Ken Williams always said, this is because these children have to be Welsh children in the UK. So you cannot just be English and Welsh, you have to put both things together. I think the other big um, lesson that I think young people under understand today, but that I think we lost it along the way, is um, the politics of multilingual acquisition. Uh, because after all, the minute you talk about multilingualism, you're talking about um, a population that is diverse, a population that has been racialized, a population that when, when language, where language has been used to really colonize um, along with race. And so um, 
I, um, you know, I, I started out in bilingual education when um, there was some meaning to that movement as a political, a socio-political movement. It wasn't just about language, it was about housing, it was about economic opportunities, it was about educational opportunities, it wasn't just language. But somewhere along the line, the whole, both bilingual education and ESL became a language program. And I think as, um, again, my good old colleague, Frisian colleague, that's in, from the Northwestern part of the Netherlands, where there was a big um, minority movement um, in the 1980s, 1990s, uh, Kuhn Zondag was his name. And Kuhn always said to me, Ophelia, bilingual education, ESL programs, all of this has to be not for language, but for children and communities. So if there are two lessons that I want to start with, Julianne, are those two. First, that you have to trust your own lenses. You have to build on what has come before you, but make meaning for yourselves in, through your own experiences, um, through a new generation that is living in a very different world from the one that I started in. And secondly, not to lose sight of the fact that you're working for children and communities and that there is a socio-political aspect to this work that has to come alongside language, uh, that you cannot separate the two. Thank you, yes. Um, I, I think one of the most important things that I've learned at the GSC is that um, Anytime you are you are entering the conversation about bilingualism, translanguaging, you are inherently political. There is no apolitical conversation about what it means to be bilingual or multilingual. That the the presence of multilingual bodies is in itself political in many ways. And that if you're going to do that research, either as a monolingual researcher or a multilingual researcher, you have to acknowledge that. Um, and also, I think um, to your point about seeing things through a new lens, I think. So many of, I mean, I, there are some students in the chat here that I had in my sociolinguistics class and I can see them doing that work with your work in such really nuanced and beautiful ways. So I think that those gears are already churning in the, in the work of people that have been inspired by your work and future generations, especially those that I see at the GSE. Um, so I have a few topics that we've set up, um, but before I do that. Does anybody want to respond to Dr. Garcia's uh, comment, opening comments? Don't be like my undergrad students, y'all. <laughs> Don't make a call. <laughs> this is an open forum, so you be, feel free to either raise your hand or unmute yourself um, to make comments. Julian, maybe I'll talk a little bit more and then people can start thinking a little bit more. Sure. Um, I think so I saw one student that had their hand up. Wendy, did you have your hand up? I did. Hello. Okay. Um, my professor is uh, uh, Anel Suriel. Nice to see you. Um, but I um, wanted to ask you, um, Dr. Garcia, that one of the biggest things um, for me, so I was observed. Um, I teach bilingual language arts in high school. And, um, you know, Dr. Suriel introduced us to, um, you know, uh, you and translanguagism. And there are many moments where I'm not calculating, you know, languages. It's just kind of flowing naturally. And even though I planned it out a certain way, certain sections in one language, um, certain sections in another, it just kind of um, braids together the way it does. And in one of my observations, my supervisor said um, that um, that was kind of frowned upon. She said, you need to stick to either one language or the other. And um, I forget, oh, she said, you need to be able to use language to where students can gain capital, which um, was new to me. And I kind of bit the bullet on that one because as you know, like it can be very political in these relationships you know, they, they take a while to form. And I was just like, okay, it's my first observation. I'm just going to take it. But what would your thoughts be? You opened up with, you know, trust yourself, trust what you see, trust your experience. Um, I've been journaling, you know, uh, my reflections on this. 
But is there anything that you would recommend when it comes to this like political side to it where your supervisors are telling you, no, you have to use language this way? What would you advise? I'm, I'm so glad you raised that, Wendy, um, because um, I, I, I want to first emphasize what Julianne said, which is that, you know, as Nelson Flores said once, translanguaging is a political act, right? Uh, but not all of us are in the same position to exert that political act in the same ways. So even in my own work, when I've done projects in schools for a long time. The CUNY NICE project was a, a long range project for six years. Um, I enter into schools um, differently because what you want to do is you want to make sure that your work fits into whatever language policy the school has. So um, I, um, you know, I, I I respect and I think that it's important to respect spaces for languages, right? Uh, because as we all know, all of us who are bilingual and are raising bilingual families know that unless there is input, you know, and input is still important, right? I mean, uh, all these things are really still important. Unless there is input and there is ways of having some output, meaningful output, there is no development. So you have to have the spaces. The idea of course is that you have to be Nobody's able to also to a, okay. a translanguaging space, right? Uh, a space in which um, you are um, ensuring that these bilingual students are using all their repertoire in order to make meaning and learn, right? Uh, so how you do that I think is, is a an art almost. Um, I, I think it's very important, and I'm so happy you have raised this alongside the political aspects of this, because I think it's very important to understand that translanguaging is not simply to go from one language to the other. If that's what it was, we wouldn't need the term translanguaging. Code switching was that, thinking of going from one language to the other. I see translanguaging in the trends as going beyond, like transcend. You're transcending the thinking that language is just an entity, an object, right? And what we have to remember is that language as an entity, an object, is really an effect of colonization and nation building. Wherever we have looked, that's what it is. What human beings have is the capacity to language, right? Languaging, we all have this capacity of languaging, but language as an entity, as a standard object is something that has been the effect of, of um, colonization, nation building, in which institutions such as schools have played such an important part. So um, what I would say to you is um, that, um, you know, as a, as a new teacher maybe, or as a new scholar thinking about all these questions is that you never say that translanguaging is about doing anything you want linguistically. We know that is what we do uh, because after all, that's what, that's what bilinguals have. Bilinguals have a repertoire, a unitary repertoire, uh, just like monolinguals have a uni unitary repertoire. The difference is that monolinguals can usually um, take out of it, select, um, leverage almost all their repertoire, almost all the time. You know, you, you don't talk about curses in school or you don't talk a certain way in school but otherwise you can access almost all of it whereas bilinguals be um, uh, mindful of the fact that they're really only working with less than half of their repertoire most of the time right so i think as a teacher what you have to do and especially a bilingual arts high school teacher i think what you have to do is think of what the purpose is what your purpose is 
Uh, there are times in which a purpose is the development of certain linguistic features, right? Uh, the development of, of ways in which you handle language with only one part of the repertoire, because after all, that's what we are taxed, bilinguals are taxed, ta taxed to do, right? Uh, in most assessments. Um, and what it is about making sure that uh, you are engaging with them creatively and critically. I think what is most important for a language arts, a high school language arts teacher to work with is to ensure that the students understand um, the criticality of language, how language has been used in, in domination, right? And I think that's important. And that's something that one can do through readings. At the same time, to make them understand that there are spaces sometimes that have to be constructed instructionally so that uh, languages develop um, separately. But what's important to remember is that even when we're talking about these two languages, what we do as bilinguals is we have only one repertoire with features, right? And that what we're always doing is selecting which features are appropriate to use uh, with certain interlocutors, right? So that's, I think that's, that's the way to handle that, that. I don't know if I've answered your question, but I think we have to be smart about um, the way of thinking about this. And I think the most important thing to remember is that translanguaging is not just to go haphazardly from one language to the other. That's what code switching is. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about not the external perspective, not thinking about language first, but thinking about the speaker first, the person first, the child first. How do you, how do you, how, do that, how does that child put together their repertoire, right? Which, you know, we not only does it consist of English and Spanish in your case, but it consists also of the ability to, to act, of gestures, of the ability to draw, of many other things. And I think also um, having uh, sort of in mind the idea that uh, as a teacher, there are there's a difference between product and process, right? There are times in which you want the product to be in one language or the other. The way that we as bilinguals arrive at a product in one language or the other is uh, through a process that uh, leverages our entire repertoire, right? I don't understand how as teachers, we can constantly say, as educators, we can constantly say, say that we have to leverage, leverage the background of the child, the background knowledge of the child, and then forget that some children have much more than English or even much more than French or whatever, right? So um, how do you leverage their whole repertoire so that they can think engage in learning, create, um, uh, be critical, uh, all of the things that educated people really need to do, and at the same time, produce products in, in the other language. So that's, that's, I think that's the way you have to think about it, Danielle. Uh, I mean, Wendy, sorry. Yes, thank you so much. Um, is there anyone else that wanted to comment on that or ask another question? Well, Dr. Garcia, I think on that, on that note, um, um, my colleague Anel gave me a question to ask that I think relates a lot to this, which is that often when we try to present the idea of translanguaging to teachers um, or to people that are not involved in, in language education studies or language acquisition studies, they often, um, default to the definition of it as kind of similar to code switching, which we know that it's not. So one of the questions that we wanted to ask was for teachers that maybe do not have kind of the background of understanding translanguaging, how would you define it for teachers maybe in content areas or outside of language acquisition studies? How would you define translanguaging in a way that really defines it as separate, something separate from code switching, which is moving fluidly between different registers and different, uh, you know, um, contexts of language or different um, 
codes of language, but not necessarily what that's not necessarily what we mean when we say translanguaging. So how would you define it for teachers or encourage teachers who practice translanguaging to present it to their colleagues or administration? So I think what what's most important is to have um, to be able to distinguish between an internal perspective and an external perspective. From an external perspective, um, what when you when you hear language, uh, we as beings that have been um, um, I don't even know how to say this, but we as, as people who have been indoctrinated, taught to think of languages as objects, as uh, here, the two languages, right? Here are two languages. That is completely external. And it's, it's uh, we have to remember that language is not a, a, um, a, a structure of language features that language is a socio-political construction. I think that's very important to remember, and I'll go back to that later. So one is the, the external aspects of language, and the other is the internal aspects of language, what we have, right, what people have. And I think if uh, monolinguals sometimes have a hard time understanding this because they've only thought of language as being within a, their own box. Um, and because for so long, uh, are the scholarship of bilingualism was based simply on uh, elite bilingualism, sequential bilingual. That is, you learned a second language later in school, usually in Europe, especially, right? So, or in, in, even in the Canadian uh, context in the 1960s, 1970s, it was always um, uh, this type of, of bilingualism. Um, the bilingualism that we have today in the world is a lot more complex. By the way, it's always been there, it's just that we have now become increasingly aware of it, right? As, as we have paid attention to uh, the uh, people and speakers in African countries and in Asian countries, and we become more aware of this um, uh, uh, fluid multilingualism that sometimes cannot be separated into discrete languages, right? So again, I think thinking of the external aspects of language, the socio-political constructions, and the internal aspects of how we language. That's why I talk about languaging, because it's not having any language, it's doing language with whatever features you have. I think that that helps. Uh, let me just talk about the socio-political constructions, because sometimes people look at me like I have three heads when I say this, but um, I think it's fairly easy if you think, for example, of a place like, um, okay, so this is uh, showing my age because I'm not going to remember it, but you probably know what I'm talking about, Ethnologue, the website that uh, counts languages, right? And every time you, uh, every year, they come up with a different count on languages. Why? Because the differentiation sometimes between one language or the other is simply a socio-political decision, right? Is Valencian and Catalan the same language? Well, you know, they could kill over this, right? Um, and oh, throughout history, those of you who have studied sociolinguistics know that these have been uh, processes uh, that have taken place throughout history, right? Uh, Heinz Kloss called them Einbau, the idea of bringing two separate languages together because it's good for um, nation building or actually separating them as they did with Hindi and Urdu. So these are, you know, languages that that definition of language is a sociopolitical construction. What we have as human beings is not that, it goes beyond that box that has been defined as a language. And that's why our performances with language usually do not fit within that box. Now, 
monolingual performances do not fit within that box, especially if they belong to racialized minoritized groups, right? They don't fit within that box. Uh, bilinguals don't fit within that box even more, except we have a way of thinking about it that is external. And so that's where the code switching comes in. And what I've, I have maintained is that, um, and in the articles that I wrote with Otegi, myself, and Reed, who was also a faculty member in your, uh, I think in language education there at Rutgers, I think what we, what we have maintained is that even the work, the good work of some well-meaning scholars who kept saying, oh, code switching has structural constraints, it's orderly, it's logic. Um, uh, 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 but empirically, it doesn't work that way. Communities do not work with those structural constraints, right? Um, and often it's been my own family, my own daughters, uh, born in the US who speak Spanish and work with Spanish perfectly, who come in and start telling me things that I immediately write down because I say, oh, uh, they said that was a structural constraint, but it's not a structural constraint because bilinguals, uh, bilinguals do it all the time, right? So um, so I think that that's, that's what's most important to keep in mind. So the, the um, the difference between code switching and translanguaging is one, it's an ideological one. Uh, in practice, it looks the same, right? You can't distinguish it sometimes, uh, but in principle, it's a very different thing because we're not talking about going from one language to the other. We're talking about a unity repertoire from which we select features. Why does it make a difference? It makes a difference because if we take up a translanguaging perspective, we're also calling out the inequities that occur when schools, for example, in assessment, do not consider the child's entire repertoire. Uh, because what we have to understand then is what that, that what they're assessing is um, the, uh, this, uh, the language features, the specific language features, they're not ass uh, assessing the language of the child, right? The language of the child has to do with whether uh, you know how to tell a joke, you know how to persuade, you know how to argue, you know how to tell a narrative, you, uh, you, know, you, you, you can collaborate with others. That's what languaging is. So having said that, I want you to understand that, that this uh, shift um, includes everyone, everybody, all of us, language. We do, all of us are involved in languaging, right? Whether we're monolingual or bilingual or multilingual, all of us are involved in languaging. It's just that, uh, and that's why I insist on the translanguaging, thinking of it as beyond, right? It's just that bilinguals and multilinguals um, have, have a, a, a harder time in institutions because they have to hide so much of themselves, whereas um, monolinguals do not have to hide so much. I don't know if that explains it. I used to have a very good metaphor, but it, again, it shows my age. Uh, I love the iPhone when the iPhone had, um, I think it still does, but not for English and Spanish, for example. Um, the iPhone had a, a world um, key. And if I was texting my family, I never used just one language to text my family because it's not the way we speak. It's not the way anybody speaks at home, right? Uh, and, um, uh, and, and when I was texting my family, I often had to go back. And things to say. It's a, now Spanish, now English, and of course I didn't, and it made terrible messes uh, and things that I won't repeat here. Um, but um, now the iPhone has learned to translanguage, so you don't have to do that anymore. But they, you don't have to go from one language to the other; it automatically does it for you. So I always say, okay, the, the iPhone went from code switching to translanguaging; it's learned to translanguage. 
All right. So thank you, Dr. Garcia. And um, uh, I want to encourage um, all, our, all my colleagues, if you have a question, please uh, type it in the chat. And uh, also my second question, it's a loaded question. I want to um, ask you about what do you think about um, the practices of bilingualism and translanguaging uh, with relation to the most present um, factors as far as the sociopolitical environment, the current environment, and with relation to COVID-19 and the switch to virtual learning um, from two different perspectives, from the perspective of pedagogy and uh, classroom practices, and then also from um, um, student um, status in the classroom, if they are marginalized, if they are uh, dominating the classroom. Uh, so what do you think? Thank you. That's Thank you. Great question, Jehan. And um, so I'm very fortunate right now because since I retired just before this, I, um, I, I, you know, I don't have a lot of stories about this narrative, but I do have the stories that people tell me a lot. Uh, and I do have the experience of being uh, in my son's home when the children are, are in school. So I'll tell you about that. Um, well, I think one of the most important, one of the good things that has happened, I think, is that for the first time, um, uh, the school and the home have become more integrated, right? I mean, we've always tried to bring the home into the school, but that never worked. There was always a separation. Teachers weren't that aware. Now teachers are very aware of the home, uh, and teachers have to rely on um, whoever is assisting the children. And of course, you know, you asked me about inequities. We can get to that later, but I want to start with the positives because there's so many negatives right now. Um, that, that if we don't focus on some of the, the openings, you know, we talked about openings before. Um, the spaces that have been opened in this um, dark time, I think, I think that we would be in trouble. So um, what I see is, for example, um, mothers who do not speak English, who sit with their children and teachers saying, gee, I really didn't understand that this could be done, that there could be assistance in Spanish for, these, for this homework. Um, and, and how this has recreated this symbiotic relationship between this particular mother that I'm thinking about and the teacher, where um, uh, the teacher has not only become very aware of the mother and, and, and the fact that the mother can actually help, even though she doesn't speak English, but she's there with the child, um, and learning from the mother too, and the mother learning English also. So that's, uh, that to me is an amazing change of relationship between home and school. Um, so uh, uh, translanguaging, for example, you never hear translanguaging in schools. I mean, that's what makes it, except unofficially, right? Uh, but officially people don't even listen because we're so used to listening only with what's official knowledge, right? So for example, if I walked into bilingual classrooms, people would tell me, teachers would tell me, oh, we're doing Spanish day. And then you would sit down and the kids are, you know, doing some Spanish and some English and whatever, and the teacher is doing the same. She's not even hearing what she's doing and she's not even hearing what the kids are doing because officially, it's a Spanish day. The fact that there is um, the policy and the allocation of languages, either English only or English and another language, is not um, enforceable in the same way when you're doing remote schooling means that teachers are listening to the translanguaging that's going on in ways that they never did in the classroom. So that I think is, um, uh, I think that's, all, that's interesting uh, and important to look at because I do think that the most important um, part of instruction for teachers is their, what we have called the stance, right? Your beliefs about uh, whether this is helpful or not. I mean, if you, if you um, transforming your stance on bilingualism is important, on translanguaging is important, transforming the stance of, oh, no, 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 don't bring 
uh, don't let this a child use their Arabic or use their Chinese or use their Spanish because we are now in an English only space, but actually understanding that this is helpful, not harmful in any kind of way. So I think in that, in that respect, um, you know, it's, it's transformational in the sense that, that it could possibly transform um, teachers' ideologies, which is always what's most important. Um, uh, Johan also talked about uh, marginalization. I do worry uh, a lot about um, um, children uh, with, who are, have been labeled as disabled um, and the ability of uh, the ability to support them in the ways that they can be supported at the same time. Um, I have yet to hear of a mother who does not believe that their disabled child has abilities. Um, and uh, of course they need support, but they start from a position of strength of the child. Um, so, so, you know, this sort of inverts again, the whole relationship. You don't start with a child who has been labeled disabled. You start with a child who is the son, the daughter, um, who maybe is a great child, a great sibling, uh, a great helper in the family, who needs some help um, with educational chores, but that's not where you start. And I think that those, those inversions that are occurring in this very difficult time, that ability to see not from the institutional perspective, language or children or labels, but to see um, what, what is, what is in the home um, is, uh, maybe a lesson that we won't forget. I hope that it's a lesson that we won't forget. Um, but um, you know, I, I, I do worry that many of the children are not being served. Uh, schools are either closing or not closing. Some, you know, in, in minority communities, um, parents are working, mothers are out, uh, you know, be in the supermarket or wherever it is that they work. Uh, I, I don't, you know, the children are being sometimes assisted by extens, extended family uh, in New York City, especially where people live in very crowded um, conditions. Um, I've seen families where, you know, there are four kids with their laptops opened and it's almost impossible because of the echo. So, um, you know, these are things that we, we haven't thought through, and these are things that will have an effect in our education in the future. Um, uh, and I just hope that we learn from this experience what we need to unlearn, because we needed to unlearn a whole bunch of things. And then when we come back, what, how we need to handle things so that, um, so that the gaps uh, that that are evident, of course, uh, depending on the resources you have to assist your children, or the resources you have in order to have the luxury to hire a teacher for a pod, which is happening in many uh, well-to-do families, or, you know, if, the, that, if those gaps can be in some way uh, filled. So there's a lot of work that we have to do later on. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. Um, I have a follow-up question. If, if, is there any question in the chat box? Anyone wants to ask a question? Okay. So there is I'll, actually a question in the chat if whether you want to um, go um, first. Yeah, or... there's, a, uh, there's a question from um, Dr. Duncan. I, I would argue maybe, I am Dr. Duncan, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I would argue maybe have your follow-up uh, Jahan, just because it, it may be more relevant to what Dr. Garcia is talking about right now, and then I'll ask my question because it's a little bit off to left field. Um, I think uh, um, uh, Dr. Gatomer also had a question. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, and just so we know our timing, 
I don't, we right. may be able to go over depending on um, people's schedules, but um, technically this is ending at one. So we're at like a little less than 15 47, minutes. Yeah. So. <laughs> so I know so that, yeah, I know that uh, Dr. Gatomer had a uh, question and then we can let Dr. Duncan ask hers and then maybe we'll see where, where we're at. Up. Right, yes, let's do that. So go ahead. Well, okay. Uh, hi, Dr. Garcia. This is Drew Gatoma. Thank you so much for this. Has just been wonderful. So, I uh, really appreciate it, John. Thank you for uh, inviting Dr. Garcia in. Um, so, I do work in, um, you know, through my career in educational assessments. And, and so, one of the things, there have been a couple of, so I, when I think about the translanguaging issue, you know, if we start thinking about assessing for commutative competence as opposed to English competence, it, you know, it, it starts admitting um, different kinds of evidence. So one question I had is, have you had any, are there any discussions within the larger assessment community about sort of incorporating these kinds of perspectives in the assessments? And then more specifically, I think about efforts at what we call culturally responsive assessment and that's where trying to develop assessment items that leverage the competencies of students and build off of that and um, asking questions that are consistent with the cultural backgrounds of particular students. I'm not familiar with work though that has directly addressed some of the issues that um, you're speaking about. And it seems to me that it would be actually really interesting, important to do that kind of work. So um, that'd be interesting. Thank you. That question. I mean, I think that the tougher not to crack here is assessment, of course. Um, I think that there are two ways of thinking about it. I think that uh, teachers who are uh, working with translanguaging theory in mind are making sure that their formative assessments uh, really differentiate between uh, when they're assessing for general language performances and language performances with specific uh, features, language features. And I think that's a big difference. And I think that uh, especially people who are working with reading records now have become very aware of the fact that they cannot assess a child's reading uh, uh, ability or reading performance um, without really thinking of how to balance this out with um, assessment, not only in the other language, but assess assessment that allows the translanguaging to occur. So informative assessment is happening. Um, people like uh, Laura Sensi Moreno and uh, Nogaron Liu and, and are, are working with this very, very well. Um, <laughs> Standardized assessment, as you can imagine, is quite another question. But I must say that um, EDS in the form of Alexis Lopez has been working with um, translanguaging assessments for content, for example, um, because um, you know the, the, the terrible part of all of this is that we're assessing in English or in the other language. Um, content that sometimes you can't get at. You can't get at what the child knows if you do it in one language or the other. So Alexis has developed and ha is um, piloting um, uh, tests um, for middle school uh, math. You have to start somewhere uh, in which uh, the children, and it's very simple, the children are, are allowed to answer either in writing or orally uh, using he started with English and Spanish, English and, or Spanish or both. So it's it's starting. I think it's difficult. As you know, um, psychometricians have all these formulas of how you do um, uh, content validity and reliability studies. And um, I think technology is going to help us there because um, tests, assessments are moving away from just um, standardized multiple choice, but there is a lot of live uh, environments that, that are being tested out. So I think eventually we can move to really um, assess the child's ability 
to for, first of all, how they use language without specifically thinking of language features. And secondly, whether they um, know content or not. So I think that these things are coming. I don't think I'll see it in my generation, but the young people out there will. So. Okay. Thank you so much. Dr. Duncan, please go ahead. Hi, sorry. Um, hi. So I'm, as, just to give a little context, I'm a science uh, education researcher, so I, I am not really uh, that familiar with the con these constructs and translanguaging, and I'm, I'm thinking about relationships to other constructs that I'm a little more familiar with and, and, and sort of how much you can stretch this idea of translanguaging. So in um, science education, one of the things we talk about is disciplinary literacy and the idea that communicating in science, reasoning in science, discourse in science also has as a particular language. And even for monolingual middle-class children who are familiar with formal English, the shift to science discourse is still quite a, a hurdle. Um, and I think that what you see in science classroom is, and this is what I was wondering, is this more like code switching in terms of using more scientific discourse versus the English they're used to? Or is there a sense in which this can be construed as, as instances of translanguaging? Because there, there really is a way of being as a science researcher and communicating and arguing and persuading and the way we talk is quite different. Um, and so I was curious about that, what your ideas are around that. Yeah. Um, well, so um, I th think the work of translanguaging is mostly about multilingualism, right? Um, but certainly the idea, first of all, bef before I get to science, the idea of language is a lot more than the written word, right? This is, um, or the verbal, um, this is um, something that Again, we have prioritized, but it's uh, the deaf community would, will tell you that's not where it's at, right? So how do you how do you think about language in its full capacity, the full capacity of a human being to language? That's why I always exist on the gerund languaging, and um, science is um, it's an amazing subject to think about this because. Uh, the performances in science are all about doing experiments, coming out with. So it's not just the verbal, but it's also the acting on, on, on science. I would think that, um, just like I said before, uh, translanguaging is um, also done by monolinguals, even though, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I try to not talk too much about that because then the other part gets lost. Um, I, I would think that also um, what, what students involved in science do, uh, engage in science uh, do, is um, acquire, uh, add these other features of language and um, ensure and form a unitary repertoire that they can maybe write the report with certain features, but think and discuss it through the science experiment with other features. So in a way, we are always translanguaging. And I, yeah, yeah, you're right about, I mean, you can extend it to think this way, right? Thank I don't know if I answered your question, but that's yeah. That, yeah. right. No, thank you. And I think the multimodal in translanguaging is very important. It's an aspect that I have not worked with a lot because I started from school and in school, of course, the verbal, the, the written and the gestural is most impor important. Um, but there are a lot of people now working on translanguaging from a multimodal perspective. How do you, uh, for example, this, this uh, a lot of work in the UK in places like the butcher shop, how does the uh, Chinese new arrival buy um, <laughs> buy uh, meat from from the Bulgarian butcher? How how is it that they're communicating? Um, and this is all translanguaging, right? Um, 
my work centers on another type of translanguaging, and it's um, and I I center my work on interactions that, that are not precisely equal, right? Like when you're trying to buy a piece of meat, <laughs> you're gonna they're gonna if, if to sell it to you, they're gonna try, they're gonna let you do whatever, whatever you want, because they want to sell. Whereas um, in schools, it, that's not the case, right? So I think it can inform it, but uh, uh, yeah, you, you know what I'm talking about. A lot, lot more, less, less ability to negotiate, you know, more impositions in school. Right, absolutely. So I think we only have- Thank you, Dr. Garcia. I don't... <clears throat> Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Jody. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if we have time for any more questions. Yeah, so I was just going to want ask one, um, not not silly question, but one lighthearted question to kind of wrap up um, because I think this has been so incredible for so many of us. For me, because I, you know, back when I was a little master's student, I started reading your work, and so it's kind of like meeting your hero <laughs> a little bit. Um, and I, you know, I think so many of the people on this call are, are either, you know, uh, mentor, mentees of people who have been inspired by your work. So hearing you talk about translanguaging is, it has been really amazing. And I'm sure that everybody feels the same way. So thank you so much for being here. Um, and so the last question that I wanted to ask um, was what is on your nightstand right now? What are you reading? What would you suggest for all of us to read? Because we all have well, you know what? I'm not going to say downtime. I don't know where this myth of like because we're in quarantine, we all are have downtime. I don't have downtime. You know, I don't know anybody that has that. But if you are reading something, what's on your nightstand? What do you encourage people to read right now? Okay, so let let me tell you something. On my nightstand uh, uh, is uh, crap. I mean, I read uh, mysteries, Gamache, uh, Louise Penny. So don't ask me about my nightstand. We, but, we encourage that here. Listen, I love historical fiction. Philippa Gregory, lover. We love, we love, uh, we love trashy romance and mystery novels here. No judgment. <laughs> so, but on my desk, I think if I was going to recommend one reading, I would recommend a Portuguese, the colonial theorist, uh, who is not, who's a philosopher, he's not a language person per se, but his work speaks so clearly to language students. His name is, he has a long name, Boaventura de Sousa Santos, S-A-N-T-O-S. Um, and Santos, I'll put it on the chat. Uh, and Santos um, writes about Boaventura de Sousa Santos. Um, and he writes, uh, he has a book called Ep Epistemology of the South. And I think that it is such a powerful, it transformed my thinking actually. So I can only recommend things that I think go beyond um, and that I learned from. And then of course, I, I think that most important in this last uh, few years has been the work of Nelson Flores. Mm. Uh, linguistic ideologist. Nelson was my student Please. and I always think um, you know I learned I, I learned a lot from my students and I certainly his uh, his uh, contribution has been magnificent and very important for applied linguists so we are um, big fans of Dr. Flores <laughs> a lot of a lot of uh, any of my students Absolutely. my students in socioling know that we're big fans of Nelson and Jonathan Rosa's work, so, and all of these people that have been directly influenced by the work that you've done. Dr. Garcia, thank you so much for being here today. Um, is there anything else that uh, to wrap up or, I know we're out of time, but. Um, I, I was just, <laughs> I was just going to say, if anyone knows anyone who could not make it, I did record the session. So um, it should be up on the GSE YouTube channel by, at least the end of this week, or if anyone wants to email me for the link, I can do that. Um, so if it can be available to those who were not able to attend. Um, I wanna thank Dr. Garcia as well. It's been a pleasure working with you and preparing for this. Um, 
Uh, if anyone else has anything to add, I think we're done. <laughs> Thank you again. Oh. You and, and keep up the good work. There's lots of work to do and hope you all go back and unlearn what you learned and relearn some things when we go back. Yeah. Thank you so much. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Good job, team. That was great. Thanks, Colleen. That was awesome. I didn't do anything, so that was... <laughs> well, I didn't do it. I just talked. <laughs> she's awesome. She's amazing. And she's really... I mean, it's hard to tell on email, so it's like... I, oh, my hands are sweaty the I'm whole time. I'm recording this. I'm recording this. Wait. <laughs> oh. Okay. I guess I'm going to have to end the meeting. <laughs> Stop recording. Okay. Okay. I don't care. No, she can, it's good. No, I it's think good. she's amazing.